Okay, hey, so uh, let's see, welcome to the lecture for Monday. There are a few more things we have to talk about with the uh, physical properties of stars and uh, the idea of abundances. If you look on the ANSI Learn site, there's another homework, woohoo, uh, basically putting together everything we've, uh, we've talked about then to, to you know, basically tell me all about the, uh, the physical properties and um, of the star, I believe it's Procyon then, and telling me its temperature and its surface gravity and all sorts of fun things like this uh, that we've been, we've been talking about, just putting it all together. Um, gosh, all right. And also, if you look on the Ask You Learn page then, um, up there at the top, uh, I put a whole bunch more documents um, that, are, that are handy references. And up, also up there then is a, uh, a table of volumetric corrections that you will need for this homework assignment. So you can look there or look back through, I think it was the last lecture, maybe the lecture before that then where I also showed a, uh, a table of volumetric corrections or you can uh, get them online through astrophysical quantities or something like that. Anyways, all right. So uh, moving on, there's just a little bit left to talk about with the, uh, the physical properties of stars and the composition, which is where I left off at. Um, on Wednesday. And here's where it gets, I don't know, a little weird. You no, know, this is astronomy. Um, we should be used to weird at this point. But the whole idea of how we talk about abundances, and if you talk to a spectroscopist like me who worries about abundances, then um, this is basically the language that I'll be using. And we'll talk about then um, the abundances of elements sort of relative to each other and relative to the sun. So if you're, if you're you know, talking to, to someone and they talk about you know, the, the iron abundance of a star and they'll often use this bracket Fe over H notation, you know, what this means then is it's the logarithmic abundance of iron with respect to hydrogen in the star that you're talking about relative to the sun. And a couple of points on that, I think I made this on Wednesday, the point is here we're talking about number abundances. And you need to be careful because sometimes people talk about mass abundances, how much hydrogen makes up the sun by mass. You go, oh, it's about 74%. Well, how much of the sun is hydrogen if we look at particles instead? And those hydrogen atoms, and the, the lowest mass of all the atoms, and about 92% of the particles that make up the sun then are hydrogen. And so, it, so you have to be careful. You have to be explicit then about what you're talking about. And again, with spectroscopists and talking about you know, the compositions of stars, things like that, then we almost always use number abundances because it's the individual atoms and the interaction of their electrons and with photons that are creating the features in the spectrum we see. And it doesn't depend on the mass of the atom. It depends on how many of those atoms then I have in my you know, box of gas that are doing the absorbing or doing the emitting. And so we talk about number abundances then. And so, you know, this bracket notation, Fe over H then, it's the logarithmic abundance of iron compared to hydrogen in the stellar atmosphere relative to the sun. And so if we talk about, you know, Fe over H in the bracket notation of zero, well, that means, gosh, okay, 10 to the zero power, because this is logarithmic, that's one. That means that star, you know, has just as many iron atoms per hydrogen atom as the sun does. Or if I say Fe over H then is minus one in a star, that means, okay, 10 to the minus one, that's one-tenth, or one over 10, 10 to the negative one. And you go, oh, well, that means then for, for every hydrogen atom then in the star, it's got 10 fewer iron atoms compared to the sun. Or the ratio of iron to hydrogen then in the star is 10 times lower than the ratio of uh, iron to hydrogen then in the sun. Or Fe over H is minus two, well, two, 2, 10 to the 2, that's 100. 10 to the minus 2 is 1 one hundredth. So if I say Fe over H is minus 2, I'm saying, all right, well, the iron abundance relative to hydrogen in the star is 100 times uh, smaller, weaker, lower um, than what we find in the sun. And that's what's going on then uh, with this notation. And that's sort of what this means. So if you look and you go, oh, um, you know, it's a I don't know, it's, a, it's an old disk star then with, a, with an iron abundance and a negative 0.5. That means then that its, uh, its abundance of iron is deficient by about a third or 10 to the negative 0.5 when compared to the sun, looking at the iron to hydrogen ratio. And, and at least that part kind of makes sense. And again, it's handy 
using these logarithmic notations. One, because the span of metallicity in stars is huge. The very, very lowest metallicity stars are like minus four, minus five with Fe over H. And, and stars today then are, are being born then with overabundances of iron to hydrogen as compared to the sun, you know, plus 0.3, plus 0.5, something like that then. And so there's a huge range in, in these abundances in stars. And it's also handy though, because working with logarithms, if you're multiplying numbers and you're doing it in logarithms, that's the same as adding the logarithms of the two numbers. Or if I divide by two numbers and I do it with logarithms, so I just need to subtract um, the two logarithmic values to do division. And it makes the math then a little bit easier. And I should also remind you though, from, from Wednesday then, when we talk sort of about the overall abundance of heavy elements of metals in a star, and again, I'm wearing my astronomy hat and I'm talking about metals. I'm talking about everything then that is heavier than helium. And so to me, nitrogen, oxygen, they're both metals. And they're heavier than high, they're heavier than helium. And so the overall metal abundance of a star, sometimes you'll see it then just as, as M to represent the overall metallicity, um, or sometimes A, um, A over H. We usually just talk about, uh, about iron, though, to sort of represent that quantity or that, that, that idea, that overall metallicity abundance. Well, you typically use iron then as a proxy because the overall iron abundance, everything sort of tends to scale with, uh, with iron. It's not completely true. It's not absolutely perfect. This is astronomy. It depends on the, the nucleosynthesis that resulted then in the gas that you've had, or we talked about uh, the type one or type two supernova, or we're talking about AGB stars then blowing their gas off, then they're not gonna make any fresh, fresh, uh, fresh, iron, but yeah, they're going to produce a lot of CNO process elements, something like that. General proxy though, iron for overall metallicity. Um, and when it comes time to, to actually doing this, oh, when I see there's a mistake in my slide, uh, give me a second. Uh, this, I will not stand. This will be confusing. Give me a second. I'm just deleting this one thing here. There we go. All right. We're, ah, there we go. So when we're talking though about you can talk about the abundances of atoms and relative to the mixture that we see in the sun. What's the, the carbon to iron ratio? How, you know, how, does, how does carbon then scale relative to iron in a star as, as compared to the sun? Or iron to hydrogen, how does the, the, the iron compare relative to hydrogen in the star than it does in the sun? So we can talk about then these sort of relative abundance differences or rather ratios then compared to the sun. At some point, though, it also does maybe help to talk about the absolute metal abundance and how many, if I have a box of gas from the photosphere of this star, how many iron atoms are in that box? How many carbon atoms are in that box? How many, how many titanium atoms are in that box? And, and so talking about this idea then of absolute metal abundances. And to me then, I just remember first seeing this, and this is where, uh, at least to me, it started to get weird. Because as astronomers, then you need some sort of a zero point for that scale. We're talking about, you know, absolute abundances then of, of, of atoms in a box, something like that. Uh, you need some sort of arbitrary zero point to start talking about these abundances, this number of atoms and these absolute abundances. Then. And we use a scale then where imagine having a box and in that box, sort of the zero point of the scale, and we're going to measure the abundances all relative to that. And, and you can you can see why this gets tricky, because, you know, the number of atoms in my box, it's going to depend on the pressure uh, or the density in the way it gets complicated. So we're just going to say, just so we can compare apples to apples, I'm going to have a box. And the, the zero point of my box is there's going to be 10 to the 12 hydrogen atoms in that box. So if I have a box of the gas from the atmosphere of this star, I gather up that box and I make my box, you know, whatever size it needs to be in order to have 10 to the 12 hydrogen atoms in that box. Or the convention is when you're talking about absolute abundances, that the abundance of hydrogen in the box or the abundance of hydrogen and gas you're talking about on a, log on a logarithmic scale is 12. And so when you talk about then maybe the abundance of some other element then in that box, the absolute metal abundance relative to, you know, it's in that box relative to hydrogen, we can talk about then the ratio of atoms of some element A compared to the number of hydrogen atoms in that box. You got 10 to the 12 hydrogen atoms in that box. Well, the logarithm of that, we're going to express this then as our zero point. We've got our 12 
plus the logarithm then of the abundance of that element relative to the total number of atoms in the box, and then minus then the logarithm of the number of hydrogen atoms in that box relative to the total number of atoms in that box. I mean, really, you'd want to express this abundance then of this element then with respect to the total number of, of atoms in the box. But that's going to change depending on the composition of the box. So what we're doing here is we're just saying, I'm just going to set everything up. So I've got 10 to the 12 hydrogen atoms in my box. And I'm going to talk then about the, the abundance of these different elements relative to that quantity of hydrogen. And the total number of hydrogen or the total number of atoms in the box, it's not only going to depend on the total number of hydrogen atoms in the box, which I know is 10 to the 12th because I built my magic box for the death 10 to the 12th hydrogen atoms in it, but that the total number is going to be different depending on the number then of this other element or maybe even all of the other elements then in the gas, the, the, all of the metals then in the gas. And so, so, all right, if we're just going to talk, though, about the abundance of that element then relative to the total number of hydrogen atoms in the box, well, that's just going to be 12 plus the logarithm of the total of the number of that atom divided by the total number minus the logarithm then of the number of hydrogen atoms uh, divided by the total number of atoms. And again, you remember how logarithms work then. The log of A over N total minus the log of NH over N total is really just the log of A over, over NH. Fair enough. And so if you look in the sun, um, the number of hydrogen atoms then, the logarithm of the num number of hydrogen atoms with respect to the total number of particles in the sun then is minus 0 0.0360 then. Or if you get clever with your math, then this corresponds to a mixture of gas where 92% of the total number of particles in that gas then are hydrogen atoms. The other 8% are helium and other stuff then. And if you look at some other element then in the sun, oh, I don't know, like maybe the logarithm then of the total number of iron atoms with respect then, or sorry, the number of iron atoms then with respect to the total number of particles in the sun's atmosphere, then the total number, adding them all up, hydrogen, helium, everything then, uh, that works out to minus 4.54. So the logarithm then of the number of iron atoms compared to the total number of atoms in the sun is minus 4.54. So when we talk about the absolute abundance, say, of iron relative to hydrogen, perhaps in the sun, well, that logarithm then is going to be our 12 minus the logarithm, or should I say, plus the logarithm of the abundance of iron atoms compared to the total number of atoms, and that's minus 4.54. So I've got plus minus 4.54 here, and then minus the logarithm then of the total number of hydrogen atoms with respect to the total number of atoms in the sum, that's minus 0 0.0360. So I've got minus minus 0 0.0360, or that just becomes a plus, and so 7.50 then. And so what that means then, the abundance of iron uh, in the solar atmosphere, then the number of atoms then um, compared to the total or to the number of hydrogen atoms then is, I don't want to say this, 7.50. Or if I, the, the logarithm then, that's the better way of saying it, the logarithm then of the total number of iron atoms with respect to, to hydrogen atoms in the sun then is 7.50. If I want to figure out then what ratio that actually corresponds to then, well, I've got 10 and I subtract then my abundance of hydrogen, I take my abundance of hydrogen atoms, 12, I subtract the logarithmic abundance of, of iron atoms then, minus 7.50, and I get 10 to the 4.50, or about uh, 3.16 times 10 to the fourth uh, below that of hydrogen then, or or one, what would you say, one thirty thousandth then um, the abundance of, uh, of hydrogen atoms, and that's how many iron atoms you have then in the sun. And this is weird stuff the first time you see it. It's a, it's a crazy way of talking about stuff, but when you're talking about sort of the, the absolute number of particles, as opposed to, as opposed, again, going back to here, where we're talking about Fe over H, with this bracket notation here, or we're expressing it logarithmically, this ratio logarithmically, with respect to the sun's abundance. Oh, look, it's overabundant in iron, in iron compared to the sun. Oh, look, it's underabundant then in barium compared to the sun. And here we're talking about then the, the actual number of particles with respect to hydrogen on a scale then where your box has 10 to the 12 hydrogen atoms in it. So it's a, it's a different way of talking about the abundances because this doesn't depend then on 
the abundance of the sun. Here you're talking about my box. If it has 10 to the 12 hydrogen atoms in it, then it has, you know, I don't know, 10 to the negative, what would that be? 10 to the about negative 5 nickel atoms then um, in my box uh, per, per hydrogen atom. All right, so it's, it's just a different way of looking at it. And, and if you do it long enough, it, it does start to make sense. I promise you that. Uh, but you can go on and say, all right, so for some star then, I found the logarithm of the number of, hydro, or of iron atoms then compared to the number of hydrogen atoms then in the star, the absolute abundance of, of iron atoms relative to hydrogen on a scale then where hydrogen is you know, 10 to the 12 particles in my box and the logarithm of that ratio is 7.67. So I go out and I find that then and I want to I wonder then how this compares then to the iron to hydrogen ratio then that I would find in the sun. And so I'm interested then in finding out what my bracket Fe over H is then my ratio of iron to hydrogen that ratio compared to the sun the logarithm of that ratio then just use that equation then, where the, the logarithm then of the ratio of iron to hydrogen in the star minus the logarithm then of iron to hydrogen in the sun, that's going to tell me that I'm just looking at the ratio then of these two things. So we're dealing with logarithms, so I subtract it, n over Fe, or sorry, n, the number of hydrogen, the number of iron atoms per hydrogen atom in the star, divided by the number of iron atoms per hydrogen atom in the sun. Oh, wait a minute, I'm doing logarithms, so instead of dividing, I'm going to subtract. I subtract the logarithm of Fe over H for the star minus the logarithm of Fe over H for the sun. Well, I know the star is 7.67. I know the sun, because I just figured it out on the last slide, is 7.5. The difference that this means, if I'm looking at the logarithm of the number of iron atoms compared to hydrogen in the star, Compared to the sun, then the difference between these is 0.17. And I remember, oh, wait a minute then, this is logarithmic. I'm working with logarithms here. The bracket means I'm expressing this ratio as a logarithm then. That, all that means then is the, the difference then in iron abundance then 10 to the power of 0.17 then, or it's got about one and a half times the number of iron atoms um, per hydrogen atom than the sun does one and a half times, or 50% more iron atoms per hydrogen uh, than the sun does. And, and again, remember, we're working with logarithms here. So this slight difference then in the number of iron atoms per hydrogen atom, that points, uh, 0.17 then, actually is pretty significant, because again, because we're working with logarithms. Here's another example then. Um, uh, the nearest halo star to the Earth then is Captain Star. It's a, it's a halo star, it happens to just be blowing through the disk right now. It's a high proper motion star. You look at it, you look in the literature, they say it has a metallicity then. And again, we're using iron as a proxy for the overall heavy element content, content the overall metallicity of the star then. You say, oh, it's got a metallicity then of minus 0.86 dex. And technically, the units on this bracket notation then are dex. And, and so dex, dex is a weird unit because if you think about, you know, what units then do the res what units then does a logarithm, the result of a logarithm, what units does the result of a logarithm have? And you say, well, wait a minute, in order to, to do a logarithm then, uh, what goes into the logarithm can't have units. You know, you, so you've got to divide some distance by some distance. So, you know, so what goes into a logarithm can't have units. What comes out of a logarithm technically doesn't have units. But to tell, you know, whoever, whoever's listening to you or whoever's reading what you wrote, that this quantity then is a logarithmic quantity then, you put the word dex after it, which just means this is a logarithmic quantity base 10. That's what's up with that dex word then. It's, it's almost sort of the units for logarithm, but it's not. It's just a reminder then that this is a logarithmic quantity base 10. So how does this star's abundance of iron relative uh, to hydrogen correspond or compare then to the sun? And you say, all right, well, that's easy. The bracket notation means it's the logarith logarithmic abundance ratio relative to the sun. So the abundance of iron in the stellar atmosphere relative to the, uh, you know, the, the ratio of iron to hydrogen in the sun is... That's, that's all that 0 .8, negative 0.86 means then. So 10 to the negative 0.86 is 0.138, so it's got about 14% the overall metallicity that the sun does in terms of the number of particles of, 
particles heavier than helium, the number of metal particles uh, relative to helium compared to the sun, it's only got about 14% of the heavy element composition that, that the sun does relative to hydrogen. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Um, you probably might have to go through it a few times. I've been doing this for years and it's still sometimes it just strikes me as the weirdest way to talk about this stuff. But when you really think about it a little bit more, it may be sort of the only way uh, to, to discuss then the compositions of, of objects. Um, all right, so, um, all right, that brings the to, to an end sort of this section then on the properties of stars. I'm going to shift gears really quick and come on. One last thing I want to talk about then is the determination of elemental abundances. How do we take a star and sort of put all of this together and figure out then what the star is made out of? And if you look at the, the structure of this class, it's been a little bit weird because of the COVID restrictions. But if we were doing this in person, there would be a couple of class projects then that we'd also be doing. And one is doing a periodogram then of um, a star based on actual, actual spectra that we would go out and get. And I think we're still gonna do that. I think it's worth doing. And sort of the final project then is I, I give you a spectrum and you go through that spectrum and actually calculate then the composition of a star based on that spectrum. And that's sort of the final project uh, for this class. And we're going to do that. And I'll, I'll sort of swing back and talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. But maybe, maybe I just want to start off, though, with, with first worrying about, well, why do we even want to determine then what a star is made out of? Why are we interested in the chemical compositions of stars and other objects? And I only mention this because when I was starting off and you know, wanting to be an astronomer, when I was basically your age in college, thinking about doing the astronomy thing, I wanted to do the black holes and the, the cosmology and the big bang stuff and all that crazy stuff. And I thought the abundances of stars and meteorites and all of this stuff was about the most boring thing imaginable. And, and it, it, it always strikes me as, as really strange that, that today that's actually what the bulk of my research is on. And, and it's actually a really fascinating topic because with these abundances, you can talk about things like, um, you know, the, the pattern of chemical abundances that you see. I look at the spectrum of the star and do I see a lot of S process elements or R process elements? Look at barium, look at europium, and, and look at these, these elements then and go, oh, well, this is an R process element. There's a whole bunch of R process elements here. The only way you can make those is in a, a core collapse supernova. Or look then, there are these S process elements, and S then stands for slow neutron capture process elements. These are only going to happen then in intermediate mass stars that spend a long time then um, basically few doing, doing alpha capture reactions then. And you get to the point though where the temperatures are so high that the, the, the nuclei start to decay and you have then you know, the, these atoms, these nuclei then, but you also have a sea of neutrons from, from these, these other atoms then that have decayed. And you take these atoms, you, you add these neutrons onto them and you build up this unstable nucleus which undergoes a beta decay then into a, basically a neutron turns into a proton and I'm slowly walking my way up the periodic table of building elements then in this process but it takes a while then for those beta decays to happen so this is a slow process it only happen in intermediate mass anyway you can start thinking about then well the star that I'm looking at today where did the stuff that make it, make, makes it you know makes it up then where where did this stuff then come from and the generations of stars that, that came before and this idea then about you know the origin of stars or on rare occasions you can get stars then that actually do mix up fresh material from inside the star like a hydrogen burning shell and a red giant if you've got a convection zone that that mixes deep enough then you can bring some of that material in up to the surface and you can have stars and whose surface compositions and change as they evolve. This is a rare thing. Stars like the sun are not going to do this. Um, anyways, 
but but you can look then and you're, you're seeing then the, the the results of actual nuclear reactions in the star being brought to the surface and you think about well, what does that tell me then about how this star is generating energy what does this tell me about the internal structure of this evolving star so you know talking about the evolution and origins of stars this way um, you can also then find then like the lamb great the stupid fonts of the lambda uh, water stars lambda booty stars depending on who you're talking to the lambda boo stars that uh, with their discs or the barium stars that are res the result of a close binary then and you get some mass transfer then under the lower mass companion from the evolving higher mass star that changes the surface composition then of the companion so this idea then you know the interaction of stars and binary systems or the interaction of the star with its environment and binary interactions are critical to understand because you talk about the origin of you know type 1a supernova wait that's our cosmic distance scale indicator i better understand that um stars and binary systems if i'm going to really use that as a distance indicator and even even beyond this looking then not at individual stars but trends in the milky way and trends in other galaxies and over time this idea of the milky way building up heavier and heavier abundances as stars live and die and recycle that material back into the interstellar medium and new stars form from it. Well, gosh, what does this tell us then about the history of the Milky Way, about the structure of the Milky Way, about the origins of the Milky Way? Did the Milky Way result as the, the collapse of a single monolithic gas cloud a couple hundred thousand light years wide that started rotating and collapsing and spinning and yada, yada, yada? Or is it more a case of a, a sort of an accretion process where you have many small galaxies that form and sort of you know, gravitationally end up attracting each other then to form a much more massive galaxy, maybe around a knot of dark matter? Eh, I mean, all sorts of stuff then that... that, that compositions you know you need to understand the compositions of stars and things in our in our galaxy that in order to start approaching problems like this and so you can think about well all right all right i want to go out and i want to start thinking then about what stars are made of i want to start figuring out then you know how to get the chemical abundances the abundances of different elements in a star what do, what do i need for that and again, I can already tell we're going to have a font fest uh, problem. So I'll correct this in the version I put up on, as you learn now. But um, you need a high resolution, high signal to noise spectrum of the star because I'm going to need to see individual absorption lines. And so I'm going to need high resolution. And I'm also going to need to be able to measure, you know, how much absorption is basically taking place in each of the lines. How much of this light's been absorbed by the atoms in this star at this particular wavelength? I'm gonna need high signal to noise in because I'm gonna to need to measure that absorption very, very well. I'm gonna to need to know then the sort of physical parameters of the star. I'm gonna to need to know its effective temperature. I'm gonna to need to know its uh, surface gravity. The missing font here then is the little sort of weird side thing. That I'm gonna to need to know the microturbulence and I'm going to need an estimate, at least a starting place then, for the overall metallicity of the star. And I'm also then going to need a stellar atmosphere for the star then. And a stellar atmosphere then is a model of the structure of the star's atmosphere. As you go down into the photosphere of the star, then how is the temperature changing? How is the pressure changing? How is the mean molecular weight changing? Or sort of the, the, the molecular weight of the average particle then in that gas how's that changing and you can imagine then as you, you know when you go what's up what mean molecular weight imagine then going from a, just imagine a pure hydrogen gas and you're going then from a region where maybe all of the hydrogen then near the surface the temperatures are low none of that hydrogen is ionized the mean molecular mass then is about one atomic mass unit but then you go deeper into that photosphere then and you get to a higher temperature, maybe all of a sudden you start getting a lot of the hydrogen being ionized. And now the mean molecular mass, it's going to go down. Because instead of every particle when the hydrogen was neutral, every particle then is basically one atomic mass unit. Every particle then is a hydrogen uh, atom. You go down further though and you start ionizing. Now maybe the particle's a, a hydrogen nucleus, a proton, or maybe the particle's an electron. And so the, you know, you figure the electron mass is pretty much very small compared to the mass of the proton, then if it's completely ionized, the mean molecular mass is going to be about half an atomic mass unit. So you need to worry about that though. And, um, um, yeah, there we go. And, but, but you can actually, you can actually figure that out. That's way beyond the scope of this class. But if you like astronomy and you like stars, 
Um, I think maybe even in astrophysics you can do a little bit of, of it though. But I mean, the basic idea is I'm going further and further down into the stellar atmosphere. And I think about what has to be happening. Well, if the stellar atmosphere isn't expanding or contracting, uh, the, the perfect gas law needs basically needs to apply then, where the gas pressure um, is basically going to balance the weight of the material above that layer in the star, the, the gravitational force of that material pushing down. It's going to balance, be balanced by the gas pressure. Oh, yeah, hydrostatic equilibrium. I understand that. And you need then maybe an equation that describes, oh, I don't know, um, as, the, as the radiation is making its way through the atmosphere, how does the temperature gradient change due to the radiation field, stuff like that. You can figure that out uh, pretty, I'm not going to say pretty easily, but it's, it's, it's reasonably well understood. It's not perfect. There's still a lot of room to go, especially in treatments of convection um, in model atmospheres. But it's... It, Basically, you need a table then of temperatures and pressures and mean molecular weights and stuff like that in stellar atmosphere. Then. And you also don't need to know how fast the star is rotating, or at least how fast it's rotating as it appears to you. So you need then basically the rotation velocity then times the sign of the inclination angle. Because again, that rotation is going to make the lines spread out. We'll talk more about that later. Um, so what does the strength of a spectral line depend on? This should all be review. So what does the spectral length of the line depend on? It depends on, on how, of how many atoms we have in that gas, the, uh, of that particular element, or the abundance of that element in the gas. How many particles do I have? The fraction of those particles then capable of making the transition, either atoms or molecules. And it also then depends on the probability of the transition. And we've talked about these things. So we've talked about the fraction of atoms and molecules capable of making the transition, the probability of the transition, the statistical weight, things like that. And, but if you stop and think about it, you say, oh, wait a minute, I can go out and I can measure the strength of a line. How much absorption do I see? How much light's been removed? by the atoms in that gas, by their electrons, and making the jump up, not liking it, going back down, sending that light off in some other direction, how much light has been absorbed by those atoms. And it depends on these three things. Well, wait a minute, though. If I know the fraction of atoms or molecules capable of making the transition in the gas, so if I know things like the temperature of the gas, the pressure of the gas, I can maybe figure this out then. If I know the probability of the transition, and maybe I can calculate that, or maybe I can determine that from the logger or from the laboratory. That whole thing with like log GF, the GF values. Wait a minute though, if I can measure the strength and if I know the fraction atoms that can make the transition and the probability of it happening, I can work this backwards then and say, all right, I see this much absorption. I know this fraction of molecules or atoms then can make the transition. I know the probability of the transition happening. Well, in order to match the absorption that I see then, how many atoms of that element then do I need in the gas to match the absorption that I'm seeing? So everything in red, I either know or I can figure out. And that leaves me then basically, well, I can use that then to figure out what the star is made of. And there's a basic premise here then. You know, you think about these, these absorption lines, these lines in a star, and you look at hydrogen in the sun. There are multiple hydrogen lines. You look at iron lines, there's a gazillion iron lines, nickel, titanium, so there are lots and lots of lines in for typical elements in, in the spectrum of the star. And if I'm doing this, though, and I'm using this line to get an abundance, save iron, and then I use this other line to also try and get an abundance for iron in the same star, well... Those abundances that I get from different lines, they better agree because both of them are measuring the same quantity. They're measuring how much iron there is then in the atmosphere of the star. I'm using two different iron lines. And so maybe I'll add a third iron line or a fourth iron line. And the basic idea then is if you have everything right, regardless of what iron line you look at and you say, I've got this much absorption, I know this many electrons then in the iron atoms that make up that gas are capable of doing the transition and I know the probability of that transitioning happening. Well, how much iron do I need to match what I see? Regardless of what line I look at then, I should get the same abundance for every line. All right. And you can think about then, you know, well, what does the strength of the line depend on? Maybe dig a little bit deeper then into this idea of the fraction of atoms or molecules capable of making the transition. 
Um, and I don't know how many of you had, have had astrophysics yet, though, but that, that's just then um, the Boltzmann equation. Where, and this is not, I'm not going to make you do this equation on a homework or on a test or something like that, but it's something you should see where it's just then that if I've got some box of atoms, maybe nickel or titanium, something like that, and that box then is at a certain temperature, the number then of nickel atoms then with electrons in state B versus state A, maybe excited state A and excited state B or ground state A and excited state B, whatever, that ratio then is basically equal to E to the power of the, you know, the, the negative of the energy associated with that energy level uh, divided by KT and E to the you know, negative that. And this GB and GA here then, those are basically the statistical weights of that level. Remember, for high, basically how many different ways can you pack an electron then into that energy level? And remember for like hydrogen then, there are two different ways to pack a, a, an electron then into the ground state of hydrogen, either spin up or spin down. You go up to the second energy level of hydrogen then, and um, there are eight different ways to pack an electron in there. You have spin up, you have spin down, and then the angular momentum states. You can have uh, L is equal to zero or L is equal to one. And so you've got that plus the spin states and that gives you eight possible ways then to pack an electron into the second ex uh, second energy level, the first excited state in hydrogen. You go up to n equals three then, and you're talking about uh, 18 different possible ways then uh, to pack the electron in. So these Gs, then, these are just the statistical weights, and you can do a little bit of math here then. And the ratio then of atoms with electrons in excited state B versus excited state A then, it's just going to be then the ratio of the statistical weights times E to the power of the negative of the difference in energy divided by KT. So you tell me the temperature of the gas, you tell me the statistical weights, and I can tell you at that temperature how many, how many uh, atoms then are going to have their electrons then in this excited state B relative to some other state A. Oh, all right. Um, also, though, don't forget, surface gravity is also important in this and having the electrons then in the right place to do the absorption then that you're interested in. So this is the Boltzmann equation. Uh, this next equation here, this is referred to as the Saha equation, where here, instead of looking at electrons in excited states, different excited states, here we're looking then at atoms then that have been ionized. And so this Ni here then, uh, these are the atoms then of some element then in ionization state I. And up here then, Ni plus 1 then, these are the number of atoms then that are in ionized state, uh, ionized state plus 1. So this might be like um, neutral calcium, and this might be calcium 2 here that's missing an electron. Or calcium 2 down here, and then calcium 3 that's missing two electrons then up on top. It's just that ratio of that, of uh, the number of atoms then in one state compared to the number of atoms then in that one state, ionization state plus 1, that have lost an electron. And he, and E here then, this is the number density of electrons in the gas. And remember, that's important because the more electrons then that are in the gas, the more free electrons, I should say, that are in the gas, the shorter the lifetime then of the ion, the more free electrons you have. Because, you know, the, the less time it's going to take for that ion then to run into a free electron, they're going to recombine and you don't have then um, an ion anymore. All right, so we've got that. And then we got, you know, sort of a hot mess here, but things like two, you should recognize, and the pi, and the k, and the t, so the Boltzmann constant k, the temperature in Kelvin, uh, the pi is pi. The m here is the mass of an electron then. H is Planck's constant. T is the temperature in Kelvin. Uh, again, the g's here then are the statistical weights. Same thing, how many electrons then can I pack in there? And then we multiply the whole thing by e to the power of the negative of the basically the ionization energy, the energy it's required then to ionize then atoms that are in in ionization state I, like for hydrogen then, that would be 13.6 electron volts. For hydrogen, with its electron in the ground state then, if I want to kick it off the hydrogen atom, I need 13.6 electron volts uh, for a photon, 912 angstroms. So you're talking about hydrogen then, ionizing hydrogen, this energy would be your 13.6 electron volts. And then again, divided by KT. All right. And so, um, and again, the number of electrons then, it's related then to the overall electron pressure in the gas. That'll just be the, the number of, the, how, 
I say the number of electrons n times kt will give you the electron pressure anyways. So you can figure this out though. If you've got a model atmosphere, then you know the range of temperatures, you know the range of pressures in that atmosphere. Boom, I can tell you then how many calcium two atoms do I have with their electrons in, in the second ionization state? How many of those per the total number of calcium atoms in that gas? And how many of them are in that, you know, have been ionized once and their electrons enter in that second state, I can tell you then the fraction of those, those calcium atoms and from these equations. The other thing to note though, that we're also gonna to have to worry about though, is the effect of broadening mechanisms though, also in very, very strong lines. We talked a little bit about that with microturbulence. This idea then, if you've got broadening mechanisms, like a Doppler broadening mechanism, where you've got some of the atoms moving towards you, and they're gonna be doing absorption then at slightly bluer wavelengths, some of the atoms then moving away from you that are gonna be doing absorption in some of the longer wavelengths. If the line's particularly strong, I will get extra absorption then by atoms moving towards and away from me then, uh, just due um, to the broadening mechanisms themselves. All right, so this is all likely a little sort of ooh, a little confusing this will be sort of the last project then in this class and i'll walk you through then the steps on how to actually do this um but right now um this actually is sort of the the end of the course material for for um spectroscopy and, and again if you look in the syllabus then there's a lot of time spent working on projects there's a lot of uh, time spent working on your lab spectra we're not ready for that so i think if you're like me everybody's a little tired we didn't have a spring break and what i'm going to do then what i'd like to do then is sort of transition away from the lecture part of the class where i'm just sort of yakking at you to more of the project part of the class and and i think what we should probably, what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, is just sort of take a little break. Like maybe we won't have class on Wednesday in the sense that I won't lecture to you or there won't be a recorded video or anything like that for Wednesday. We'll pick this up on Monday and we'll start talking then about the first project where I want you to basically go and get some spectra from a, from a big survey then of stars and, and basically look at the Doppler shifts and do a periodogram then basically look for whether or not it's a binary um, in the radial velocities. We'll pick that up then on Monday. And so really, and then once we're done with that, we'll do the abundance project and then we'll start working on uh, reducing the lab spectra. Hopefully by that point, everyone will have a lot of spectra from lab then uh, that we can work on. Um, and we'll sort of round the semester out that way, of course, with a final at the end of all this. But for Wednesday then, no recorded lecture, nothing like that. I'll be sitting in front of my computer then on Zoom, uh, basically when I would be recording this from 11 to 12. And then also during my office hours and on, on Monday after, on Wednesday afternoon, I'll be there um, also on Tuesday. But so with that time then, um, work on the homework and what you really need to do, and I'm a little bit worried about this because about half of you didn't turn in the last homework assignment. And I'm, I'm a little bit worried about why and one of the things that's concerning me is maybe you're having problems getting that old Linux computer thing uh, running on your computer. And I should mention that's absolutely critical. And that's sort of why back in early February, I think February 2nd, I, I, I asked you to start wor you know, working on getting those things ready because the project that we're going to do with radio velocities needs the Linux. The project then that we're going to use the abundance or do with the abundances needs the Linux. The reduction then of the DSO spectra needs Linux. And if you don't have it, that's a good chunk of the rest of the class that you're not gonna be able to do if you don't have the Linux running. And that's not gonna be good. So take Wednesday then to also work on, work on your Linux if it's not running and you know, come see me if you're having problems with this. All right. Well, hopefully then that makes sense. Don't forget the homework. Start working on getting the Linux machines ready. And, uh, you know, I'll be around on Wednesday if you have questions about this, in addition to my regular office hours. All right. So um, think about this stuff, get working on it, and I will, I will see you around. Take care.